I'm Jessica Varnum. I'm the deputy director of the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies and thrilled to be able to moderate the seminar today with George, not only because he's a fantastic colleague, but because this is a particular area of interest of mine as well, nuclear power. Um, so I think it's an always timely topic, but every time that we give one of these seminars where we talk about nuclear power, there's all kinds of new developments that frame the discussion about what's likely to have next, happen next. And, you know, I was looking through before the seminar to see what were the most recent headlines in nuclear power, because I think if you come to the seminar casually or with more expertise, you know, you're going to be looking at what are the big events of the day. And I think any conversation about the future of nuclear power that we're going to be having is framed in the context of, on the one hand, the Biden administration and other world leaders seeing that nuclear power could be absolutely essential to clean energy's future. And on the other hand, headlines like the fact that there are major nuclear reactors in the middle of an active war zone in Ukraine right now. And so this is a, a really important topic. And Dr. Moore is particularly well positioned to share with us his thoughts on the subject as you've seen his biography to some extent probably, but I'll just share a couple highlights. He's a scientist in residence here at CNS and has uh, an enormous background with the International Atomic Energy Agency, the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, as well as being a licensed reactor operator who was in the US Naval, US Navy for many years and is now in the US Naval Reserve. So I'll turn it over to you, George, to share with us your thoughts, and then I'll help to moderate at the end when we can share a larger discussion and questions both here in the room and also remote on Zoom. Please feel free to share those. I think you had said during the during the lecture is also fine, but we'll try and save most of them for the end. Yeah, during the lecture is fine. Uh, speak up if you got questions. This is going to be a very basic level presentation. So, you know, if you've taken uh, Ference's NPT class, some of this may not be new to you. Uh, some of it may be new to people. I'm trying to trying to reach the whole audience here. So what we're going to cover today, we're going to talk about nuclear reactors, kind of the current state, electrical generation, nuclear power research reactors, training reactors. We'll talk about propulsion reactors, space reactors. By the way, how many of you think, how many of you think that there are any reactors in space right now? If you count thermal devices. No, not RTGs. We'll talk about that maybe separately. I mean, reactors that provided power for satellites. I'm going to say, I'm going to say, Operating, no. No. I'm going to boldly no. say, no. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. subjected them out to geos geostationary. Yes. The Russians for many years operated space reactors with their RORSAT program. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And the end of the RORSAT program at, well, not the end of the program, the end of the useful life of these satellites that are in low Earth orbit, they got boosted up into a parking orbit to decay. And there are a lot of them up there. They flew 80 some missions, but originally they had the, they were bringing the reactors back, then they started doing this boosting program. I think there are 30 or 40 that are still up there decaying. And one came back, well, two came back in an uncontrolled manner, and we will talk a little bit about that. So we'll talk about, is there a nuclear renaissance? That was a buzzword uh, five, 10 years ago. Uh, you know, there's a nuclear renaissance. Uh, Fukushima put a real uh, uh, downturn on that. Uh, and that's been, Fukushima's been almost 16 years ago. So uh, we're gonna talk about that. We'll talk about the new bills, things that are, there are some new bills. Uh, problems for developers, generation four reactors. We'll spend some time talking about small modular reactors, where we are and why. We'll talk a little bit about the nuclear fuel cycle and waste, because that's still an ongoing issue. Then we'll talk about military reactors. We'll talk about reactors in war. We'll talk about Zaprisha, And we'll talk about the Geneva, Geneva Protocols. And finally, we'll spend a few minutes on AUKUS. This is the program where we're going to lend or sell uh, nuclear power to attack submarines to the Australians. So let's get going. First of all, what about the number of NPPs in the world? Nuclear power plants, ones that are designed for producing electrical power. Well, we have about 435, roughly, in 32 countries. Uh, by the way, everybody can get a copy of this presentation, so if you want to take notes, that's fine, but you'll have a copy of the slides. Uh, 
in the U.S., we have about 90 operating reactors in 28 states. Combined, they produce a total of about 90-some gigawatts. A gigawatt is 1,000 megawatts. Excuse me, it's 1,000 times 1,000 megawatts. So to put that in perspective, Diablo Canyon has two reactors down the coast here. Each one of them is about a megawatt. Uh, see, I'm having trouble right now with numbers. Each one of them is about 1,000 megawatts, or a little bit over 1,000 megawatts, depending on how they're running. But uh, you know, so you have two of them, and generally the plants in the United States are almost all at about uh, 1,000 megawatts. Uh, so you add them together, multiply by 92, you get up to you know, the number of gigawatts. Rule of thumb for all power reactors, they're about 33% efficient. So that means that in making electricity, whatever the rating of the reactor is in thermal power, it's only about a third of that could be turned into useful electrics, electricity. So if you have a thousand megawatt electrical, and that's usually the way we talk about nuclear power plants, that means it's about a 3000 megawatt thermal reactor. So, you know, when you're dealing with things like accidents, you've got to deal with the thermal power level. Conversely, when we talk about propulsion reactors, like for submarines, we don't rate them in electrical power, we rate them in thermal power. So this, you know, when you're comparing it's a little bit apples and oranges, and you need to be aware of what's doing what. So here are uh, NPPs uh, per country. You see the United States is in number one position there, and that number two position is France. Number three is China, very close to France, and that's going to be changing uh, as a function of time. China is building more reactors, the most active reactor builder in the world right now. Now, that's one way of looking at it. Here we're looking at numbers of MPPs. If you look at it in terms of what the rated capacity is of the power plants, it inverts a little bit in the first three. And France loses its number two position, drops down to number three, and China comes up because the Chinese reactors are bigger. The French reactors are primarily older generation reactors, uh, and they're not as big as some of the new Chinese reactors. So, you know, what do you do with all this? Well, not too much other than be aware of it. Um, if you look at what the nuclear generated power, electric power is as a percentage of all the power in the world, okay? It used to be up around 17%. This is we're looking at 19, I can't even read the slide from here, 1996. It's now down below 10%. This is through 2000. 2021, and it hasn't, it's gone a little bit lower. Now, you look at that and you can say, oh, well, that's terrible. Nuclear power is dropping. It's not that nuclear power production is dropping. It's that the other energies in the world are increasing so that nuclear is becoming a, less, uh, a lesser percentage. If you look at NPPs by region, uh, you know, you, you can read the slide. Uh, what you don't see much there is Africa. There's a little tiny bit because Union of South Africa has one plant. Uh, you know, the big, the big places are in Western Europe and in North America, us in Canada, and uh, what's growing down at the bottom is Asia, okay? Uh, Eastern Europe, uh, the red part, that's fairly constant. Most of those are old Soviet reactors. There's not a new, lot of new reactor builds there. And even there are not a lot of new reactor builds in Russia right now, although they're building some experimental ones. So let's talk a little bit about these types of reactors. Are they fission reactors? Are they fusion reactors? Do they run on thermal neutrons? Or do they run on fast neutrons? Well, thermal neutrons are neutrons that are up there. Their speed is about the speed of gas molecules at room temperature, okay? But that's still very fast. We're still talking, if you talk about, it's like 3,000 meters per second type of speed. It's not. It's not that they're just sitting there, you know, bombing around, sitting <laughs> around. Fast neutrons, when we talk about fast neutrons, we're talking about neutrons that are born at the energy of fission. Neutrons that are born at the energy of fission are born at about, it varies, but about 2 million electron volts. Electron volts, we'll, we'll see this in the next slide. Well, we won't here. Um, let's go back. Uh, Two million electron volts is just an energy number. 
In contrast, thermal neutrons are a small fraction of an electron volt. So they're less than one millionth the speed of fast neutrons. And so that has some implications. We wanted, for a number of reasons, we want to use thermal neutrons as best we can. For some reason, this is not, this clicker has ceased to work. Is there anything we can do about that? It's yeah, I'm of, sorry. Let me. It is frozen. It seems like it's frozen. Go ahead and share again. Share again? What does that mean? Just oh. reset it. You know how to reset it. <clears throat> okay, we're back. Okay. Uh, okay, this is something that you should begin to understand if you haven't seen it already. This is a curve of binding energy. All the nucleus, the neutrons and protons in the nucleus are bound together. And they're bound together with a certain energy. If you look up to the right, we're talking about the binding energy in the really heavy elements like uranium-235, which we use for fuel. And if you fission uranium-235, see it goes down to where that vertical line is. Uh, and you recover about, if you look at the left hand, axis, you can recover about 2 million electron volts per nucleon. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but you've got a couple of hundred nucleons. So you could get, you get about, you get about 200 million electron volts per fission. On the other hand, on the left hand side, if you push together some of the light nuclei like helium, hydrogen, which is high, helium, hydrogen, the various isotopes of hydrogen, you can recover a lot of energy that way. Although you recover a lot more energy per nucleon, there are a lot fewer nucleons. So one of the trick questions you always ask graduate students is, which is the more energetic, a fission reaction or a fusion reaction? And they'll say a fusion reaction because look at how much energy you recover. Well, not true. You get from fission, you get about 200 MeV. From fusion, you get considerably less. You can multiply the numbers out. Okay. So this is a presentation from the chart of the nuclides. And if you haven't begun to see this in your, for the students, if you haven't begun to see this in your training, uh, you know, you, you really need to begin to look at it. In the vertical axis is the number of protons in the nucleus. On the horizontal axis are the number of neutrons. So for example, if you look at the third Third row down, that's uranium, uranium isotopes. You see on the left, uranium-233, uranium-234, 35, 36, 37, 38. The dark ones with the black tops, 238, 235, indicate that those are relatively stable. And there's also 234. Now, all scientists lie to you. They'll always tell you that, you know, you, when you hear a presentation, you'll say, hey, it's uranium-235 and 238. There's also 234 out there. But 234 has not been there since the beginning of time, like 238 and 235 have. It's part of a decay, naturally occurring decay chain. So it's always there. It comes out of uranium 238 decay chain. It's always there, and that's always a surprise to people that they're stable uranium 234. So if you look at this, you can tell very easily what happens and how you make plutonium in a reactor. Look along the uranium line. If you add a neutron to uranium-238, it becomes uranium-239. In the horizontal direction, if it loses an electron from the nucleus, that means that essentially a proton gets created, so it jumps up a level, but it stays on the same diagonal line. So what happens is plutonium, excuse me, uranium-239 decays to neptunium-239, which are the, again beta decays to plutonium-239. And that's what you want if you want to, that's the way you make plutonium-239 for weapons. Okay. Now, the bad thing is the plutonium-239 sits in the reactor, it keeps absorbing neutrons. So it absorbs one, becomes plutonium-240, which is kind of a bad actor for some things, it absorbs another, becomes plutonium-241, et cetera, et cetera. So this type of presentation allows you to understand how things work. 
the clockwise equation. We'll show this side of thing again when we look at the fission fragments. We'll show it again when we look at the thorium fuel cycle. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Can one generalize about how likely plutonium-239 sitting in a reactor is to either absorb a neutron and become 240 or 241 versus fissioning? Like can one, because it's also yes. fissioning obviously. Yes, you can. The way you do that is you look at the fission cross-section and you look at the absorption cross-section and you compare the two. Okay. And how do they compare? I don't know off the top of my head. I suspect that the absorption cross-section is much lower than the fission cross-section. That seems At the end of life, for a typical like a pressurized water reactor like Diablo Canyon, it will be burning almost 50% plutonium at the end of life, as opposed to burning uranium 235. So it, it does become a, a function in the burn. Okay, so reactors, all about the neutrons and the nucleus. We're not concerned with the orbital electrons. We're not concerned with the protons. We're not concerned with this. It's all about the neutrons. Fast energy, about 2 million MeV, must be slowed down for a thermal reactor to work. This is called the process of moderation. We also refer to these fast neutrons as prompt neutrons. These are the ones that come right out in fission, as opposed to delayed neutrons, which come out after the fission. And if we didn't have delayed neutrons, we couldn't build reactors. That's just a given, I'll explain why in a minute, but most people in high school, they get the presentation about, yeah, there's, you know, fission, chain reaction. There's an old video around or movie around where it's a bunch of ping pong balls and mouse traps, and they throw in a ping pong ball and, you know, goes along, goes along. That's not what happens in a reactor. If it did, your reactor would be a toast. That's what goes on in a bomb, okay? So here's the cross-section. If you, this is on a log-log scale, if you look at the vertical axis on the left, this is the fission cross-section, induced fission. And induced means we're inducing it by a neutron. Along the bottom is the energy of the neutron that induces the fission. So if you go from 2 MeV here to these low thermal energies, you're getting about a thousand-fold increase in the fission cross-section. So that means 235 nucleus is a thousand times more likely to fission if there is a, if it goes into a 235 nucleus. And that's the way we build thermal fission reactors. And almost all of our reactors are thermal fission reactors. We'll talk about that in a minute. What happens in the fission process is the nucleus splits up. You get a couple of fission fragments typically but this is probabilistic. Sometimes you can get three fission fragments. It can be really weird. They're not equal. If you look at the atomic numbers on the bottom scale, you'll see that they center at around, one, one group is around 96, the other is around 137. And it can go up and down depending on what isotope it is that's fissioning and you know, what it's got. You also get about 2.3, 2.4, neutrons released in a fission. Sometimes you can get one, sometimes you get three, sometimes you get three or four. The average is about 2.3. This is uranium-235. It's a little bit different. Plutonium gives you a little bit more, uh, but not worth mentioning when you're just trying to understand the concepts. So here's how delayed neutrons get produced. One or more of these fission reactions, and there are about seven or eight, in its decay, and it's, radio it's radioactive, its decay involves the emission on, on some of their decays, emission of a neutron. These are the delayed neutrons. Okay. They're usually significantly lower in energy than the prompt neutrons are. And if you didn't have these, you wouldn't have time to do any kind of reactor control. The average half-life of the delayed neutrons is about 55 seconds. So, you know, if you were do pulling control rods up and down manually, you know, you don't, wouldn't have to be Usain Bolt to run out, move the things. You could uh, just do it, uh, you know, walk on out to the control, to the reactor face and do it. It's not the way it's done, it's all done automatically. But without the prompt neutrons, no reactors. 
So you can either think that nature is really cruel or really great uh, by providing us with prompt neutrons. Okay, this is just a, another trilateral nucleus in a different portion. This is down where you have these fission fragments. Uh, you get this later and look at it. Okay, what types of reactors are in use? And this is important when you start talking about reactor types and how proliferation resistant they are. So, power reactors, thermal and fast, pressurized water reactors, they are a type of light water reactor. That means light water is regular old water. Of course, it's very pure water. Boiling water reactors, boiling water reactors are a different type. They are also light water reactors. We'll explain the difference between a boiling water reactor and a pressurized water reactor. It's how you get from, it's how, it's how you make the kettle to boil steam. Reactors are all kettles. You can think of them as like an electric kettle operating at a very high temperature to produce steam to drive a steam turbine. Now then we have the CANDU reactor, which stands for Canadian Deuterium Uranium Reactor. This is an unusual reactor because it uses heavy water. This is water which has, instead of hydrogen, it's not H2O, it's D2O or it's DHO. Uh, and the difference is that the cross-section for absorption of neutrons for regular <clears throat> water with just simple hydrogen is higher than the absorption cross-section for deuterium. Now, that makes a difference, doesn't make much of a difference when you're using enriched fuel, but the CANDU reactor burns natural uranium. So you don't, have to have, you don't have to have an enrichment process. You can just burn regular uranium as you dig it out of the ground and then you know, go through the process of putting it into a metallic form. And we have gas cool reactors. And gas cool reactors, instead of using light water, they're using gas, various types. Uh, those are less prevalent. Then we have research reactors and we have Test reactors, they're pretty much the same. Research reactor, we usually talk more about a research reactor being one that's used for some kind of training. For example, those people who went to the uh, Prague, Pro Prague Practicum this January with me, they were in a research reactor at the Czech Technical University. Test reactors, we, those can be pretty high powered. We usually think of those as things that do materials tests and things like that. Propulsion reactors, these are propulsion reactors for military and civilian vessels. The Chinese have just announced that they're going to build a very large container ship plugged with a molten salt reactor. That's going to have a lot of problems. I've been working on an article about that. Anyway, and we have space reactors. We use space reactors. We had a snap series of space reactors. Uh, we also had nuclear aircraft back in the day. This is propelling a nuclear aircraft with a nuclear ramjet. It's uh, kind of cool if you make mind having a radiation trail uh, behind it. Same thing for cruise missiles. And we were even thinking about uh, not power reactors in cars, but reactors using RTGs to provide electric vehicles powered not by plugging into the Tesla charging station, but by having a radioisotopic thermal generator in your trunk. So it's batteries. Good. It's only not good if you get rear end. It's like batteries. <laughs> like you think of it as a nuclear battery. RTGs, I think we have a slide on it later, but RTGs, you make an RTG by getting a highly radioactive element. In the United States, we use plutonium 238. The Russians use strontium 90. You put the radioactive material up against a metal plate and you boil off electrons on the other side, which you just use as a battery. So for example, the Apollo missions had very, very large plutonium-238 systems on board to power them on the moon. The hierarchy of doing things in space is solar is most of the power, but solar has limits. It doesn't, it can't get the high power density. Next level up, use RTGs. Level above that, use power reactors. If we go to Mars, we're gonna to have to take power reactors. No question. Uh, you know, there's just not enough, you can't get enough out of solar, you can't get enough out of RTGs. Pressurized water reactor, what are we talking about? Well, the steam kettle is over there on the left. 
and it's completely pressurized, and there's a primary loop of water. And that primary loop goes from the, contain, uh, the, the core, the red and orange areas in the core, that's where the fuel rods are, coming in from the top are control rods. You pump water through there, heat it up there. The, the difference between the heated water coming out of the core and the heated water coming back in is not very much. We're talking maybe 30, 40 degrees Celsius. You know, it's not huge difference uh, because that would create thermal shocks and a bunch of other things. So you get the reactor up to power. See them in the middle is a pressurizer. This is a steam bubble on top of water and that keeps the pressure steady. The water then goes over into a heat exchanger. In the heat exchanger, there are a bunch of tubes that heat the water in the steam in the heat exchanger. See it's changing to steam at the top. You don't see it on this slide. It goes out and that goes out to dry up the turbine. Okay, so that's how you need to use a regular turbine to generate electricity. Actually, it's not a regular turbine. This is very poor quality steam. If you were ever ship associated with shipboard engineering with regular steam plants or like Moss Landing, you would laugh at the quality of the steam. It's very low quality steam, but it works. But you have to design the turbine to deal with this low quality steam. Okay, boiling water reactor. This is the other kind of white water reactor which we see. Here, everything is in one kind of can. You do pump water in, and you do pump water around, but the water that you're pumping in turns to steam inside the reactor core. So the steam that comes out of the reactor going to the turbine is potentially contaminated. It's, it's contaminated just from some of the reactions already, but if there's any there's any corrosion, anything like that, it can go out in the steam. And so your turbine is going to be contaminated. And at the end of reactor life, you've got to get rid of a contaminated turbine. Uh, this is, why would anybody do this as opposed to doing a uh, pressurized water reactor? This has some advantages. Now, this is a type of reactor that uh, was at Fukushima. Or that there were all the reactors, there were boiling water reactors at Fukushima. Uh, this is a, basically a General Electric design. The PWRs are basically uh, Westinghouse design. Now, what, all these things have transformed by association with other countries. You've got Westinghouse and Hitachi, you've got maybe it's GE and Hitachi. I can't keep track of all that. Uh, but this is, both of these types of reactors are very similar in, you see the dome on top? That's the dome on the, uh, on the pressure vessel, that's tightly bolted on, and you only take that off and have access to the fuel when you're refueling a reactor, and that occurs any time between one and two years, and it's not a total refueling. You're refueling, you're taking out some elements, you're shifting elements around, because you want to equalize the burn of the fuel rods, and in some positions, they burn up faster than they do in others. Reactor designers try and get away from that, but that's different. Okay, here's the can-do, heavy water reactor. The can do has looks like a pressurized water reactor in that the primary coolant is in a separate loop, goes in to the steam generator, and goes out clean to turbine. What you have is different is the fuel rods are very small. The fuel rods are pushed in and out at the core on a daily basis. They have to do this because they're burning natural uranium. So every day there are fuel rods coming out of the calandria and have to be dealt with. That makes this not a very proliferation friendly unit. In fact, the first uh, device that the Indians built apparently was with uh, fuel that they had uh, used from the Candu reactor. But it's a daily thing. And imagine if you're the IAEA and you're trying to monitor under the NPT for non-military uses, how do you do this? Well, there are ways of doing it, but it's much harder to do with something where they're changing fuel daily rather than a system where they come in once or twice a year. Yeah, Phil. Can you address why it is that in a Kendu reactor you have to do that daily cycling versus a typical uh, it's, it's because It's because the 
fuel is natural uranium. And if you, it, as it burns up, uh, you've got to replace it with fresh fuel <clears throat> repeatedly. No, oh, so because there's so little to there's so, so little volume, there's so little burn up really quickly. Yeah. There's so, so little a small there. window. That makes sense. But are they still producing them? Pardon me? Are they still producing them? Yes. Oh, yes. In fact, there's an advanced can do, which none of them have built so far, but they are uh, uh, thinking about doing it with, with a low enrichment so they don't have to they don't have to push the fuel as much. Hmm. But these, you know, control the fuel elements in a power reactor, I don't care if it's a rush, there's a little difference in how you bundle them and that sort of thing. But basically, for the BWR, for the PWR, they're you know, a little tube of uranium oxide pellets that's maybe from the floor to this overhead here. And, you know, it's, it's diameter is pretty small. You got the pellets in there and you've got a gas plenum. We could talk a lot about that, but, but basically those are the same. These are bundles and the bundles are about this long. Okay? And they're about this big around. So they're much more handleable size uh, can I just sure. follow up on something you said earlier, just so I understand it? So as these new pellets are being added uh, uh, with uranium-235, the, the, the original uranium-235 is increasingly being sort of naturally enriched, if I can use that phrase, to plutonium over uh, time. It, it's not really naturally, being naturally enriched. It's both the, the fissions per element in the fuel rod are going down, but it's shifting from being uranium to somewhat being a plutonium burn. Right. It's all in the same thing. Of course, you've got uh, fuel rod technology has improved tremendously. You have a number of problems with the fuel rods, these long, thin rods, because as the fuel burns, you produce these fission products. Some of the fission products are gaseous, and they try and get out of the uranium oxide. Some of them are successful. So they get into the fuel rod, or fuel rod itself inside the, the pad around the fuel rod. And there's actually a, a gas relief at the top with a spring loading. And hopefully that works, but sometimes fuel rods rupture. And then you get fission products out into the reactor stream into the primary loop. What do you do about that? Well, you take some of the water out continuously and run it through a demineralizer or something like that. To, to take those things out, but you can't get all of them. Okay. So it's not that it's not that. And when you replace fuel in a reactor um, on the PWRs and BWRs, you're, refla you're replacing fuel bundles, and the fuel bundles consist of. I think some of them are. I, I don't remember the numbers. Uh, it, it, there are a large number of these tubes in one fuel bundle, but you're replacing, like for example, you're you're taking the fuel runners from the outside of the, from the edge of the reactor where they don't maybe burn as much. And you put them in the center and you take some of the center rods out and put them out in storage. Uh, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a, a lot of energy goes into figuring this out because there's a big economic gain in doing it properly. George, so, when they're swapping out the different kinds of fuel in the different reactors, do any of the reactors have to be shut down or can they- Oh, the reactor right? shut down. It's shut down totally. You've got to unbolt the top. Right. And, right. and you know, the whole thing is, you, you go through this, you actually go through a burn down cycle to get down to, you know, and this comes, you know, when you talk about Sapresia and you talk about things being hot layup, that's one stage and there's cold layup. And you, know, you have to be in cold layup for a certain amount of time before you pop the 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 it doesn't get shut down. That's continuous. Pardon me? The can do does not get shut down on a daily basis. It does not get shut down on a daily basis. That's right. And that's one of the that's one of the other advantages of the can do. You don't you don't talk in terms of a long term refueling like cycle like two years or something like that. They may have, and I don't I don't know about I don't know about the can do. By the way, uh, Yan Liang, I think don't you have a podcast about can do's? Uh must be someone else. I have a I have a blog about Russian and Chinese reactors. Okay. Not about. But I thought oh, I thought but, I thought you were working on the Candu. I looked up the Candu. The Candu was interesting because it had a positive void coefficient. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. 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 This was something that came up during our our practice. So this is a gas cool yeah, reactor, and it looks very much like a pressurized water reactor, except that the cooling is done with 
gas of some sort. CO2 uh, is a very common gas. That's what the Magnox plants uh, in uh, the UK. Uh, gas reactors are very popular in the United Kingdom. In fact, they're developing even more. But still, you have a heat exchanger, you make steam in the heat exchanger, goes out, drives the turbine, uh, comes back, the water comes back into the bottom of the uh, heat exchanger and, and goes up, goes to steam. And the gas gets pumped back in to the, uh, to the reactor core. Uh, a variation, a more modern variation of this, and you, this is almost analogous to the boiling water reactor, where they put everything in the same box. So instead of having a separate heat exchanger, you're actually putting the uh, water that's boiling in. But the difference here is that this water is still clean when it comes out and goes to the turbine. So there's some advantages there. Okay, here's so kind of a quick question. Yeah. Is the point of the gas reactor that gas moderates neutrons differently than water, I'm guessing? Uh, no, actually the gas reactors, we didn't talk about the moderator. The gas reactors are moderated with graphite. Right. And so the this gas is like, doesn't moderate, in particular like heavy water would, but even like light water? Because light water moderates to some extent, right? Mm -hmm. Just a lot less than heavy water. No, in a light water reactor, the light water is both the moderator and the coolant. Yep. It does both functions. A heavy water reactor, the moderation is done primarily by the heavy water. Uh, there is light water sometimes associated with the cooling depending on the design. And in a gas cooled reactor? The gas cooled reactor, is the, the, gas, the gas is just a coolant. It doesn't do any moderation. Uh, the RBMK-1000, the Russian design, that's a gas cooled reactor. Uh, what's a little bit different about that is it has pressure tubes like the can do, and you can open it in any individual pressure tube by depressurizing it while the reactor is running. So the RBMK-1000 had potentially a deal use for military operations where you could make plutonium and pull the, pull the rods out individually. So here's, uh, you know, who has what types of reactors. Notice the 436 total at the bottom is still about right. Uh, and you start with uh, PWR is the biggest, you know, USA, France, Japan, Russia, China, South Korea. Boiling water reactors, second biggest number. Uh, they are in uh, USA, Japan, Sweden. One's missing there. Romania should be there. They have a couple of Kandu reactors. Uh, that was back from the Ceausescu regime. regime. Uh, pressurized heavy water reactors, the Kandus, like 47. Canada, India. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I said boiling water reactors. I meant to say the, the Kandu reactors are in, are in uh, Romania. Uh, light water uh, graphite reactors, uh, these are the RBM K1000s. They still have a dozen of them roughly in, in uh, Russia. Uh, advanced gas cool reactors, the UK now has uh, eight of them. They're bigger operations. You'll see an overlay to show size. The fast neutron reactors, there's only a couple of them. They're in Russia. China is now building. Uh, uh, high cool gas reactor and also fast reactor. Fast reactors burn plutonium. You see the fuel there and you see the coolant. In the fast neutron reactors, the coolant is liquid sodium. It's a metal which has to be at melt temperatures. Um, actually, the Russian Navy had some uh, uh, liquid sodium cooled. They weren't, they weren't fast reactors, but they used liquid sodium. It's a more efficient transfer medium. The second US submarine, Seawolf, had liquid sodium. They had a coolant fire, liquid sodium will burn, and Admiral Rickover said, never again. So that ceased, that ceased the use. George, the, the Russian light water um, uh, graphite reactors, that, that's the Chernobyl design? Yes, the RBMK-1000, that's the Chernobyl design. Uh, here's a scale comparison. Uh, you know, if you, uh, there's some numbers which are hard to read about the scale, but, the thing that's important is the PWR, core of the PWR is smaller than the core of the BWR. It's both are smaller than the RBMK 1000s, and all of them are a lot smaller than uh, the advanced gas reactor. Okay, so just, just some size comparisons. Not anything uh, really important here. The can do uh, is the one that's kind of in there as a round blob. 
because the face of the Kandu reactor is a round face. The Calandria has a round, it's a cylinder. So these are vertical. The Kandu is horizontal uh, in a, a cylindrical setup. Okay. Can you say, George, something about the lifetime of each of these types of reactors? Well, originally reactors were designed like the ones at Diablo Canyon for maybe a 30 year life. But that was in the heyday where we thought we were going to really be investing. The lifetimes of most reactors have been extended. Uh, the NRC goes in and checks and makes sure that they can, you know, essentially checks that they can be extended. Um, California was going to, under pressure from the state government, was going to, well, pressure from the government via the California Public Utilities Commission on PG&E was going to shut down Diablo Canyon. Uh, then Governor Newsom said, oh, hey, you know, this is not a good idea. We have power outages uh, that we have to deal with. We have plenty of solar and wind power during the day in California. It's at night when we get into problems. And reactors run 24-7. So uh, Newsom has encouraged pg e to have at least a five-year life extension on, on Diablo Canyon. Um, so when we look at all these, we need to talk about and one of the questions that comes up, we're not going to talk about much now, safeguarding under the NPT and the risk for proliferation. Uh, risks depend on the fuel type and the ease of diversion. And we did talk about it. You can build a PWR with typical PWRs like Diablo Canyon have a 3 to 5% enrichment in uranium-235. Military propulsion reactors and some research reactors use 90-plus percent U-35 enrichment, and that's the kind of stuff you can build weapons out of. You know, if you get some reactor fuel at three to five, there's not much you can do with it, unless you're a nation state and you can go through some more enrichment. Uh, but uh, you know, generally the risk of it on a fuel type, ease of diversion. Don't forget that proliferation has, and most people forget this, that's a human aspect. And that there are dual aspects inherent in any nuclear power program. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that if a new country develops a nuclear power program, they're going to develop engineers and scientists who are quite capable then, generally, of transferring over into a weapons program. So there's a human aspect to this, which generally gets ignored. In fact, I'm not sure that we, no, um, in the post breakdown of the Soviet Union, in the early 90s when things broke apart, the U.S. had a program where we tried to usefully employ uh, Soviet weapons designers because we didn't want them selling their services to Pakistan and India and you know, potential proliferate countries uh, like Iran, places where they would get well paid. Uh, I don't think we know where all the ex-U.S. designers are. I don't think once they quit, like at Livermore or Los Alamos, I don't think there's ever a system to trace it. Uh, anyway, let's talk a little bit about Zaporizhia. Okay. So now, obviously, the stuff that we've discussed before, we could do hours and hours talking about. I just want to get a flavor. Zaporizhia. These are Russian design reactors, six units. They're VVR 1000s. And that's very similar to a US PWR. Uh, Westinghouse design PWR. Uh, their current status, it changes from day to day. My understanding now is that they're either totally shut down on four of the reactors and two of them are in uh, cold layup. But they jump one up from time to time to hot layup for whatever reason, I don't know. They get their cooling from the Dnieper River and cooling pond. We'll show, show a picture overhead picture in a minute. They have it's my understanding now no connection to the Ukrainian power grid because the Ukrainian power grid has been so damaged. Um, question about they have intact emergency diesels. They have diesel fuel. I don't know how many days of fuel they have, but one of the questions has been if the Russians leave, are they going to steal all the fuel for their diesel trucks and tanks? Their IEA is on site. Uh, Director General Brasi just came back from being at Zaporizhia. I think personally, Brasi has been, uh, mispronounced his name before, but Dr. Grossi has been 
very personally courageous and politically courageous in getting IEEA people to the site. And when they travel to the site, they're traveling through a war zone, and who knows what wacko might decide to take a shot at them. Uh, vulnerabilities, as long as the reactors can be kept cool, there shouldn't be a problem. Are they subject to damage? You know, even if you hit the, these have containments which are very similar, they're not as strong as US containments and European containments, but they're pretty strong. They have, you know, reinforced concrete uh, containment facilities. Uh, they can take a number of hits without doing any damage to the core. But this whole thing is subject to tremendous economic loss. I mean, this is the biggest reactor park, not only in Europe, but but in the world, and you know, how much percentage of the Ukrainian greed they use the bridge? I think, I think it was 20, about ten percent of, of the Ukrainian grid. You know, yeah, that's an easy number to work out, and, and it's been published. I just don't remember what it is. Now, this is an overhead view, and to the left-hand side, the big area in the middle, the ring area, that's a cooling pond. And that was where the river was around the cooling pond. You see this, the water areas. And they, they have a four bay in front of the reactors. They take cooling now there. They also have a couple of cooling towers which are up on that land bridge uh, at the top. The problem is the Russians blew the dam down river. Okay. You can see again this cooling ring and where the reactors are. That's the old path of the river. That distance across there is five or six kilometers. So when that thing receded, it receded, it's already receded. They have to have a way to get water into the cooling pond. And they've been doing that by uh, pumping from wells. I thought they would go down. I thought they would throw down some sort of piping down to in the river and set up a pumping station to pump it up. But apparently they're satisfied with wells. So. That's kind of the status of Zaprija. You know, we do have Ukrainians now on the south bank of the river. And so how long this goes on, the control that's being done there is all primarily being done by Ukrainians because Rosatom could not bring people in. These reactors have been modified enough from their original Russian design that even if the Russians had enough training operators, it would take them a long time on site to learn how to operate these particular reactors. So you said that the containment vessel was relatively robust to, for example, like artillery explosions. Presumably, there's a lot of infrastructure associated with cooling, for example, that is a lot less robust. So yes. assuming yes. that if explosions land on key parts of the reactor, that could be a pretty big See, deal. The thing is, when you're when you're in the lower layout level of layup, you don't have to cool the core. It can it can you it can, can effectively cool. Okay. I think that's true in the VVR design as well. So, yes, you can damage that. Any damage you do is going to keep these plants offline for years, yep. and it's going to be a huge economic loss. Um, what's what's the status of you know international negotiations as far as Zaporizhia is concerned? Uh, there are none, as far okay. as I know. But I, I was going to mention here in a minute uh, the potential protection for nuclear power plants. Uh, you would think that it all comes from this, comes from the additional protocol one to the Geneva Convention. Okay. Uh, one of the problems with that is we don't subscribe to additional protocol number one in Article 56, which we've reserved. This is Article 56 to protocol number one, and it talks about what you're not supposed to do. You're not supposed to damage a reactor so that, even a military reactor, so that radiation could be release and harm the general public. Now, what's the enfor enforcement mechanism? There is none. So, uh, you know, and if you go back to, you go get a copy of a DOD law of war manual, such a thing exists, uh, you will find that they have a discussion of Article 56. And they say, we don't subscribe to it because this has to be a battlefield commander's decision as to whether to attack one of these things. Now, notice that this doesn't really cover military reactors. And right now, we're building military reactors, or we have a program to build military reactors to fly into power advanced bases. 
those are going to be valid targets. I don't care, you know, any, any description. The difference between protocol one and protocol two. Protocol one is international, protocol two is deals with domestic stuff and has the same same stuff. If you want to read about this, I've written two articles in the Board of Atomic Scientists about it in the last couple of years. Um, fuel cycle for uranium, and what about thorium? Well, let's talk briefly about that because, you know, this is to give you some basics and rounding in the whole thing. Uh, you know, many of you have probably seen this sort of thing. You dig uranium out of the ground, you turn it into yellow cake, you turn it into uranium hexafluoride, then you enrich it by some mechanism. And there are about a half dozen ways you can do that. The way everybody does it now is by centrifugation. You use centrifuge, you use a difference in the mass of 238 versus the mass of 235, spin it around, 238 goes heavier, it goes to the outside, you siphon off the 235, and you go through stages. You get a little bit of enrichment at every stage until you get as high as you want. One thing to understand is that there is, when you look at the energy consumption that it takes to do these things, the energy consumption that it takes to get to what we use for normal fuel and nuclear power reactors, which is like 3 to 5%, that's 70%. If you want to go up to right at the edge of highly enriched uranium, and we'll talk about that in a minute, that's a definitional term, it's at 20%. That takes another... 20%. So now you've used 90% of the energy you take. To go from 20% to weapons grade stuff in the 90% region, it's only 10%. This is important when you think about stocks that Iran has and what the potential breakout time is for Iran. So anyway, this is a whole cycle. You go back, you, uh, you have either a closed loop or an open loop. We do open loop in the United States. Open loop means you take a reprocessed fuel and you take it out and bury it, or you get rid of it somehow. The closed loop means that you say, hey, you know, all that stuff that's in there, that's useful stuff. We can burn that plutonium, we can burn that uranium, and you put it through a reprocessing plant and you make some kind of mixed oxide fuel for reactors. That's done in, in Europe to some extent and in Japan. Much better environmentally because you're burning most of the waste. Well, we chose back in the Carter administration, which is 45 years ago, to go with the open loop. We had a big uh, uh, plant, uh, a recovery plant at Barnwell, South Carolina, which got built but never used. Okay, here's another view of the same thing. If you like these graphics better, it, it's essentially the same thing. Now, here are uranium enrichment terms, and these are generally misunderstood. There's a new term on here. So if you start down at the bottom and you look, you have uh, natural uranium, it's about seven tenths of a percent, 235. If you enrich it a little bit, you get up to three to five percent or two to five percent for reactor grade stuff. What's left after you do the enrichment is depleted uranium. And that has a varying percentage, averages about 4%, 0.4%. Uh, you also call that D38 or DU. Uh, this is depleted uranium is used in projectiles because uh, it has two functions. It has a penetrating ability. It's also pyrophoric, which means when it heats up, it burns. So if you were in a warthog with a Gao 8 uh, Gatling gun on the front falling, firing depleted uranium rounds into a tank. It's not very good to be in the tank because those rounds are going to penetrate, and when they penetrate, they're going to be like uh, a thermite bomb in terms of uh, being on fire. The tank's going to take a big hit. All of that, up to 20%, is called low enriched uranium. And if you see over the left, right under the 20% line, it's called HALU. That's high assay, low enriched uranium. That's becoming a new term, which is Stuff that's close to 20%. Okay. Now, above 20%, we consider that to be potentially useful in a nuclear weapon. Is there something physical or magical about 20%? No. It's just somebody had to make a line somewhere, and that's where they made it. Okay. So 19.9% and 20% are 
are hardly any different physically. Uh, as you go up, you know, our weapons grade stuff uh, for the U.S. is about 93.5%. Uh, along the way, there are different levels. Uh, Russians, second generation uh, nuclear submarines use about 40%. Uh, you know, I don't know how many of you know this, but the Iranian, excuse me, the Indians leased two submarines, one from the Soviet Union, one from the Russian Federation. The first one that they leased from the Soviet Union was crude engineering compartment was all crewed by uh, Russians or Soviets. Uh, second one, uh, the Indians got to run the boat under a little bit of supervision, but not anything. And then the Iranians, you can't say Iranians, the Indians have produced their own nuclear bar submarine. And guess what? It looks almost exactly like the submarine that they leased. Uh, Pakistan is a little envious of that. Pakistan would like to lease a Chinese nuclear power submarine. Hasn't happened so far. But remember this when we start talking about AUKUS. Okay, so here's a bunch of stuff which I don't want to spend how we have time on this. I think we're going for quite some time. I don't want to spend much time on this. These are the uh, uh, places where, you can, where uranium is uh, mined. Big mining in Canada, big mining in Australia, big mining in Kazakhstan, uh, big mining in a couple of countries in Africa, Niger, uh, I can't remember one other, uh, Namibia. Uh, so, you know, one of the interesting things is that for most places, the United States being one exception, a couple, couple of others, in most, place, most places where uranium assets are found, you don't have oil. So it's it's kind of it's kind of strange that way. Uh, okay, thorium fuel cycle. Thorium is not a fuel. Thorium is a source of fuel. If you put thorium, look down on the bottom row, thorium stable, thorium two thirty two. If you put that in a reactor, you start the reactor up running on regular uranium. Thorium absorbs a neutron, becomes thorium-233. Just like the production of plutonium, it decays through protactinium, and then it becomes uranium-233. This is a horribly proliferation problem because uranium-233 gets produced. You don't need any enrichment. It's just chemical separation. Now, what's not on there is just to the left of that is uranium-232, which also gets produced in this process a little bit. And uranium-232 is a bad actor because it has a very high energy gamma ray uh, emission, and that uh, makes it difficult to produce a weapon. You want to keep that 232 production down. So very similar to the way the plutonium is produced in a reactor. So what you can do in a thorium reactor is you can actually make more fuel than you burn. That's only been done with uh, Admiral Ricker, one of his last projects was at Argonne. They ran a reactor, a light water reactor, doing this and producing uh, more, more fuel than they burn. Uh, accidents, spend a minute or two on those. Fukushima, wind scale is an English accident, a gas reactor on the, uh, on the east coast of England, on the Irish Sea. Uh, Chernobyl, of course, you know about. Three Mile Island, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. The bottom one, SL1, is a military reactor up at Idaho Falls. And if you look online, you can find old uh, DOE classified, now declassified videos about the reactor accident. Kill the entire crew of three. Uh, and uh, it was the only accident that I know of where they ever got the reactor prompt critical. So there's always a question of, can a reactor explode like a bomb? The answer from the nuclear industry is, oh, no, it can't. The real answer is, if you ever get a prompt critical, it acts like a big dumb bomb for just a little bit of energy and blows the core apart. That's what happened in the SL-1. The new kids on the block, small modular reactors and Gen 4 reactors. Small modular reactors, these are range up in size to about 300 megawatts electrical. So that means they're almost 1,000 megawatts thermal. Uh, they employ modular construction techniques. They're going to be cost saving. This is all 
the DOE Department of Energy has spent a lot of money on this. You know, it hasn't withstood the NIMBY test. Uh, not in my backyard. Uh, so there's a lot of different designs out there. I wouldn't put my money on any of them. Uh, many advantages, yes, true, but again, not if you get, if you can't get by NIMBY. So I suspect there's a site up in, I think it's North Dakota, where they're uh, gonna do something. And you know, it's probably because there's only a couple of farmers around that won't, won't object to having cheap power. Uh, this, these are some of the designs. It turns out that a lot of these designs look very much like French submarine reactor designs, where they put the steam generator integrated on top of the core. Uh, and you can look, you can look at these. We're running running over time wise. So get the, the advanced reactor designs again. If you, uh, if you look at this video, and I don't want to play it now, uh, you get the thing. Look at it. EBR one and two. These were at Argonne. These were advanced fast reactors. Reading and talking about reading uh, and interesting interesting stuff. Old stuff. Not a lot of new ideas in this whole area. It's just the implementation. For example, these new military reactors are basically a modern version of SL1. That's what SL1 was designed to do. Uh, we call these various generation. Generation one reactors are all gone. Generation two are the reactors that we see still online in many parts of the world. They have the canyon reactors of generation two. Generation three are upgrades of generation two. Uh, not a lot of generation three reactors. And now we're getting generation four reactors, most of which are still on the drawing boards. By that, I mean, they're not, they haven't been actually built, uh, but the, there are ones under construction. There are ones now operating. Uh, here's different types of them, like the advanced boiling water reactor, et cetera, the VVR 1200. That tells you, uh, you know, who's doing these. Uh, this is pretty current information. So you see there's a lot of interest in these, in building new modern stuff, but we've only built, there's plants that, two plants down in Georgia that have recently come online, and those are the only new builds in the United States in 20 years. So who's building? The Chinese are building. The Russians aren't building very much. Uh, Eastern Europeans are not building very much, if anything. France is teetering back and forth. Their reactors are old, they have to make a new a big investment. They're designed for, re designed for reactors and reactor management. It's very different in the United States. In France, the government, CEA, manages reactors, picks reactor sites, does things like that. In the United States, we let every uh, one horse utility that wants to buy a reactor, buy a reactor. Uh, so advanced Westinghouse AP1000, there are some AP1000s that are in business already. Notice the power is going up. Uh, the Ariba design, 1,750 megawatts electrical. So that's a much bigger reactor. But all these things involve new types of fuel where the fuel is more resistant to damage. They involve passive systems, safety systems, so that they're not so dependent on safety systems that have to activate and may fail to activate in an emergency. Okay, so here's more of these. Non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. Uh, let's spend about 10 minutes on this. Here are different types of explosives. You've got the uh, Morris City, Oklahoma bombing. About uh, one and a half ton uh, TNT equivalent. ANFO is not, even though it's 5,000 pounds, which is two and a half tons, it's not as good as TNT. We talk about nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons yield in terms of TNT equivalent. You've got the World Trade Center. If you integrate the energy release at the World Trade Center by all the stuff, you get up into about two kilotons. So you're almost in a nuclear energy. It wasn't released in a blast like that, but there's a lot of energy release. Weapons dropped on Japan, you know, roughly anywhere from 13 to 20 kilotons. So this is an important thing. We talked about this 20% cut up. I know this is by Alex Glazer at Princeton. I think he's very credible. He did some calculations. I can't say whether or not these calculations are accurate, but I 
but assume since he did them, he thinks they're accurate and they're probably pretty good. And so you see down, this is what's uh, a critical mass. And we, along the right hand, you see different reflectors. Utilize, he used or utilize, utilized beryllium. These are things you can put around the nuclear material to reflect neutrons back in. So if you look up at, at the bottom, 93%, this is for uh, uranium bomb, uh, you know, 53 kilograms, oh, I'm sorry, this is plutonium bomb. Oh, this is uranium bomb. Uh, uh, 53%, 53 kilograms unreflected, you can get it down to around 12 kilograms when you add a thick reflector. Again, when you go up and you look at 17, or excuse me, 15, that thing gets, becomes enormous. It's unwieldy. You can't make it. This is why below 20% is not considered useful for nuclear weapons. Because even though you might get critical mass, to assemble that critical mass is just so difficult. Things get harder the bigger things are. Uh, and so it's very impractical. And, you know, if you're a nation state, uh, you know, what are you going to do about that? What are you going to do? You're going to it some more. Okay. Uh, spontaneous fission rates, these are important. We talked about, when we were talking about fissions in a reactor, those are induced fissions by neutrons. But there are also spontaneous fissions for all the uh, heavier elements. In other words, you're just sitting there, and probabilistically, one comes apart. A bad actor here, if you look, is plutonium-40, 240. And 240 has a very high spontaneous fission rate. And this is what prevents you, for example, from making the plutonium gun device. Now, it's obvious now why you can't make a good plutonium gun device, because as it's coming together, it will start to explode long before it gets together because of the neutrons from plutonium-240. Now. In the Manhattan Project, they were originally going to build, that was the goal, to build a plutonium gun device. Now, those old scientists in the Manhattan Project, they weren't stupid at all. What they were working with was plutonium that had been done in an accelerator by E.O. Lawrence, and that accelerator produced plutonium had almost no plutonium-240 in it. When they started seeing reactor-produced plutonium, plutonium, they said, oh my God, there's this plutonium-240 in here, that kills the... If you go online and Google Thin Man, you'll find Thin Man cases. That was the, that was the design for the plutonium gun assembly system. Uh, and, you know, so we were going to try to figure out how they could overcome that. Nobody ever could figure out a good way to overcome it. But it put the Manhattan Project into panic. And that's why they had to shift to an implosion design. They had to bring in George Kisikowski, a big from Cornell, to try and make explosive lenses, which they were successful at doing. Okay, three ways of proliferation. One is you get access to material. Two is you get access to technology. Three is you get access by education. Uh, bomb designs, gun versus plutonium, timing and mechanics, effects are largely design independent. What do I mean by that? If you have a 20 kiloton, 20 kiloton yield from a uranium bomb, the effects are not very distinguishable from a 20 kiloton yield from a plutonium bomb. It's just how you, it's the, the yield is important. It's not how you get to the yield. Uh, single stage fission devices, uh, we don't have very many of those anymore. Uh, those were around, those, that's the way the thing started at first before we got to thermonuclear weapons. Relationship to nu nuclear reactors. This is kind of important to understand. The neutron energies. In a bomb, everything is with prompt neutrons. You don't care about delayed neutrons. They're not a factor. The timing is very different. The explosive timing in the bomb is on the order of shakes. A shake is 10 to the minus 8 seconds. So 100 shakes, explosion may be totally over. Reactors that burning goes on indefinitely. Lack of reliance on data, delayed neutrons. Can a reactor explode like a bomb? We've already talked about that. So. It takes about a half a microsecond to produce a kiloton of yield in a fission device. Uh, weapons grade materials, these are terms that you should recognize. Plutonium with less than 7%, sometimes you'll see 6% plutonium 240. Typical reactor grade stuff, when you bring it out of a reactor, 
looking to pro reprocess it, 25% uh, depends a little bit on the timing when you bring it out. Um, you can make a bomb out of reactor grade plutonium and that becomes very worrisome when you consider the places like Japan have thousands of metric tons of separated reactor plutonium. That's not a, a no longer classified concept. It was actually tested, right? Can't comment on that. <laughs> I, I, I think you might be right. Okay. Um, I read it somewhere. <laughs> Bruce, Godwin, Bruce Godwin says it's been tested. He was head of the weapons program. So I pretty much trust what Bruce says. Uh, uranium-233, uranium-235, uh, HEU definition is greater than 20, 20%. Remember that Oroloi is that's what we that's the old Manhattan name for a weapons grade uranium. It's about 93.5 percent. Uranium 233 has no definition, but you want to keep the 232 content down. Okay, gun and implosion systems, real quick. The gun system, you fire some sort of projectile, you have when it gets together, you crush some sort of initiator and you get neutrons, and that's your goal. You don't want neutrons until the whole thing is fully assembled because these are uncompressed pieces of uranium or whatever it is, material it is, they're uncompressed and you're not relying on compression, you're relying on shooting together two subcritical but close to critical systems to get a system which is uh, supercritical. Okay, here's like a picture of the atomic cannon back in the 50s firing down at the Nevada test site. We shot a lot of tests in the atmosphere that Nevada tested. In fact, I went to elementary school up here at uh, Bayview Elementary, and they would wheel in a cart with a television. It's kind of exciting in those days. And they would show <laughs> from the Nevada test site, and you see they, they'd have these are old Viticon TV cameras. You'd see the airplane coming, and the announcer would say, Now the bomb has been released. And then there would be a, a flash, but what happened with the Viticon cameras, it totally saturated them, so the screen went black. And you couldn't see anything for about five minutes until it came back <laughs> and you could see maybe the mushroom cloud. <laughs> um, gonna symbol systems, we've talked about most of this. Um, go back and look at this. It's the idea of an implosion system. You take a subcritical mass and you squeeze it until it becomes critical. You squeeze it by using some sort of explosive to drive that together. Uh, here, one of the things we can now talk about is what's called boosting. Uh, inside that imploding system, you put a little bit of gas and you get a fusion reaction. And the gas that's used is the number three reaction there, uh, the deuterium plus tritium gives you a neutron that's a very energetic neutron, about a 14 MeV neutron, which is better for fissioning. In other words, the induced fission will produce a lot more neutrons than fission with thermal or with fast neutrons. <clears throat> and that, that can really affect the yield of the device. An unboosted device might be have a yield, let's say, I don't know, 20 kilotons. You boost it, you might even get double that. But that's done now. Two-stage weapons, uh, this is a little bit historic, we don't care about that right now because we're running out of time. But this is the kind of thing you have in a warhead, in a missile warhead. You have a fission primary, which drives a secondary. Uh, and how that's done, I don't want to talk about, but uh, there are different kinds of secondaries, there are different kinds of effects you can get. Uh, but basically, this is the thermonuclear Okay, finally, AUKUS. A few words about AUKUS. This is where we're going <clears> to, <throat> UK and us are going to, for the Australians, get them some nuclear power submarines. Uh, you see on the left hand side, the French and the EU are pretty ticked off about this because France had a contract to provide Australia with conventional power submarines. Uh, and that got canceled, and France lost a couple of billion dollars, the potential profit. There, so they're not happy. On the other side, you see China jumping up and down because you know, these submarines potentially could be used against them. You have Taiwan looking on, you have Japan looking on, saying, why not us? What's missing there? 
What's the other big naval power in the Pacific that isn't shown up on this? India. No, that's not so big. What's assuming Russia? Russia. Yeah, Russia. Our daughter was uh, first secretary in the. I, I showed her this slide. She said, "She said every time I go to the foreign ministry, they remind me Russia is a Pacific nuclear power." And it is. So that's the end of the talk. We have time maybe for a few questions. All right. Um, I want to start with you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Moore, for the presentation. Uh, going back to the SMRs and Gen 4 reactors, I'm, I'm assuming somewhere in the research and development process of an innovative reactor, you have to have access to a research reactor, a high flux test reactor of some sort. And also like a, a coolant test loop or all these research devices and with like china and france and russia they can access their state research institutes but with private companies in the us can they go to, to idaho and request access or or how does that work i, I do not know but you're right that somewhere you, you have to test this i suspect that there's been some agreement where they can test at the high flux reactor in the uh, there's a problem I think there's a problem with accelerated testing in a high flux reactor. Uh, let me go back to my background in aviation. Um, you know, you do accelerated testing for aircraft structures. In other words, if a wing assembly is going to see 10,000 cycles in its useful life, you put it in a, a jig and you rig up a test system and you flex it. In a couple of months, you flex it 100,000 times. I'm just making up numbers here. You flex it for uh, two, three, five, ten times what you expect it to see in service. And you say, looks pretty good. Problem is, that wing after 20 years is not the same as it was when it came out of the factory. Metals, you can think of as being like grains of sands pushed together. Okay. You examine a metal structure. There are grains in it. And as the grains age, sometimes things come out of the grain boundaries. And when they do, you can have stress corrosion cracking, you can have a number of things which make all the accelerated testing not so good. Now, I've been written a couple of things that are critical, not of the potential outcome, but kind of try and flag the danger of life of the ship reactor cores. And that's what they've been doing. They've been taking small samples up to Idaho, flexing them for more than the life of the core, saying everything's fine. Now we've got Virginia class submarines that probably now have a dozen years, but they're designed to last 40 years. And if they get up to 25 years and suddenly have a problem, we got a real problem because we have no way to cut them up usefully and do things. We transitioned away in submarines from doing refueling. If you look at Nautilus, uh, Nautilus, the first core, actually the first core of Nautilus is interesting because it was a low enrichment uranium core. It was not a high enrichment uranium core, all subsequent cores, high enrichment uranium. But, you know, they refuel it. And they, to do that, they would have to cut the, the hull and then you have to re-weld the hull. That's typical of the way. They, and refueling outages for refueled U.S. submarines last or lasted a couple of years. Now, also, they were doing other upgrades at the same time, so it wasn't all just due to the replacement of the reactor. The French have a totally different design. They use LEU in their carrier. They use low enrichment uranium in the carrier. They use low enrichment submarines. So do the Chinese, by the way. And they um, can do a refueling, get the boat in. They have a a section that you can pull out of the hole. It's like a hatch. You pull it out. They can do a refueling, have the boat back out to sea in 30 days, which is quite different than the way we do things. There are several reports. Congress has demanded several reports from the Navy over the past 20 years about the use of low enrichment uranium. Because right now, we're not manufacturing any more high enriched uranium. And if we're going to, we're going to have to set up a new plant to, to do that. That's going to be a big ticket item. But if you look in all of these 
Navy papers, they all say, LEU, no good, no good, no good. They never mention France and they never mention China <laughs> and explain why they can do it and have useful submarines and we can't. So anyway, that's an aside comment. Other questions? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the treatment vector among the various types of reactor that you talk about, which one is the most suitable? Suitable to produce tritium? Yeah. Uh, none of them are. The, the tritium production reactors, like the ones that, uh, that they're, they're building one now at uh, Savannah River, Savannah River National Lab. You've got to be able to the way you produce tritium in a reactor is you put in uh, lithium. Lithium has two isotopes, lithium-6 and lithium-7. You want to enrich the lithium-6 content, and when you put a neutron into lithium-6, you get a triton and a uh, uh, tritium and a, and a helium nucleus. So that's the way you produce it. Uh, right now, we're very short of tritium for Tritium is useful not only for the boosting, but it's useful for making helium-3 when it decays by electron emissions, very low energy electron, very low energy gamma ray. Uh, you get uh, helium-3, and helium-3 is great for neutron detectors. That's the gold standard for neutron detectors, helium-3 gas tubes. It's kind of circular, because when helium-3 absorbs a neutron, you get uh, uh, it, 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 the, the reaction produces tritium. So you, know, you, can, you can go back and forth. Um, but anyway, tritium production, uh, what would be the tritium, produ tritium production reactor has to have a way of getting things in and out of the core on a very short basis. So they're more like a research reactor with a high flux. Short basis, weeks, months? Oh no! Uh, Days? No, you you the the in alpha T reaction on on lithium six goes right away. There's no you know you just it's a very exothermic reaction. So you have to encapsulate the uh, the lithium six in uh, some sort of really heat resistant media. I used to do this and put it in quartz. I was doing it for other reasons. And uh, uh, you know, it's, it's right away. You want to, you, you would want to have almost like a conveyor belt running through the reactor exposing this. They don't do it that way. But now that you know that, he's going to have to kill you. <laughs> Who among us didn't used to do this for other reasons? <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I'm Ali from the NPTS program. Uh, my question is in relation to AUKUS. Uh, a lot of the literature on AUKUS, which is developing as we speak, uh, talks about the narrative around the proliferation concerns associated with the very deal. Uh, as a scientist, how confident I are you in assuaging, assuaging those concerns? And for example, if tomorrow, let's say, a bunch of other countries with nuclear weapons decide to come together and have another non-nuclear weapon state within that deal, how would the US react to such a deal? It would try and do it in hordes, I, I would suspect. Well, this, this is a, these are all valid criticisms of AUKUS. Uh, you know. Other countries, they want nuclear power submarines because Australia, and as you point out, they're a non-nuclear weapon state. So far, only declared nuclear weapon states and India, which is not under the NPT, have nuclear powered submarines. So it opens the door to other people. Uh, and there's nothing, there's nothing in the NPT that prevents us. Nothing in the NPT that prevents country from doing their own enrichment program. There's nothing in the, in the NPT that prohibits it. In fact, Iran has threatened to do this several times, uh, to build a nuclear-powered submarine and, you know, use their enrichment, say, well, you know, we've got to go to weapons-grade stuff to do, uh, you know, to use it for reactor fuel, for propulsion reactor, for submarine. They haven't, you know, 
the JCPOA, uh, I don't know if I'll ever get that back from the, Personally, I didn't like the JCPOA. I thought it was, but I thought it was the best we could do. Right. And canceling it seems to me to have been not brighter international relations, but it took <laughs> us out, out, of, out of being able to influence things. Um, I, I don't know why, I mean, apparently Biden wasn't even informed that this was gonna go on until it's announced. I think it could. I think it could take taken a lot more thought because uh, I don't see tactically the advantage of nukes. South China Sea is in many places very shallow water. Uh, nuclear submarines uh, typically noisier than diesel boats. Uh, was that true? Pardon? I thought it was the opposite. I thought nuclear reactors were quieter. I thought that was a key yeah, selling point. The whole plant now they're they're the newer ones are quieter, but uh, diesel submarines are usually referred to as floating mines because you can't you can't locate them when they're in electric mode or when they're in diesel mode. Oh, when they're in diesel mode, then they're noisy. But that's but yeah, that's, are, that's yeah. very that's very little of the time. Yep. Uh, and in fact, the the right now there are, the Germans have developed these. Uh, Oh my gosh, what's it called? Air independent propulsion? Pardon me? Air independent propulsion systems, yes. And so they make uh, AIP systems where the submarine can run AIP without running their diesel for 30 days. So that would have made, to me, that would have made much more sense for the Australians. The Australians have no infrastructure to support this. Yep. They've got to build an infrastructure. Uh, you know, I, I guess it would be interesting to go back in the history and see how this how this evolved because it seemed to just spring up. It surprised the French, surprised everybody. And it's like, oh, what are we going to do here? Uh, you know, maybe, maybe we'll do the same thing with New Zealand. You, know? <laughs> you have a question? Yeah. Um, George, forgive me for saying this and using vocabulary that is just an interested commenter's vocabulary, not a specialist. I under my understanding of the sort of the holy grail of nuclear energy is so-called cold fusion. I'm old enough to remember the that hoax at University of Utah 20 years ago, whenever it was. Um, the Department of Energy announced just last year, I think, a sort of a breakthrough on on that against what us commoners would call cold fusion. Your thoughts? Is that misplaced? I, I, I don't know anything about it. I knew I knew about the coal fusion stuff. I think you're talking about NIF. About He's talking about the NIF, which is oh, not that, very cool. Yeah. No, that's not. That's the that's opposite. Le, that's laser no. fusion. That's that's laser driven fusion. That's I, I'm very familiar with NIF. Um, <laughs> yes. uh, NIF. That's I'm why I apologize for my vocabulary <laughs> right up front. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's got nothing to do with coal fusion. Okay. Uh, what they do is they have a very very small target. They have focused lasers onto the target. And it's an implosion system. The lasers mm -hmm. implode the small capsule. They get an energy release. It this creates more energy than the initial energy. They release. just got to where they released more energy than they put in. Right. Okay. This is all very interesting scientifically. I don't want to dismiss what they're doing, but you'll never make a power reactor that way. Mm -hmm. These little targets are very hard to make, and you would have to have these things on a continual basis shot into some sort of system, and you'd have to have an energy transfer system out. None of these things. The way to do fusion energy is to do a tokamak. This is where you have a plasma contained in a magnetic torus. Those have been demonstrated a couple of times, and there are, there are projects in major countries and a huge project in Europe, which the United States and China and everything else participated in, to come up with a fusion reactor. Now, there's a kind of a condescending thing that has been said about fusion power. Fusion power is the energy of the future and always will be. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not 10 years off. It's not 20 years off. Yeah, it's not 30 years off. Might be a hundred years off, but eventually they will get. And what they have to do is they have to magnetically contain a plasma. 
plasma being plasma is where you strip all the electrons off of a nucleus. This is a very hot field of a hot soup of just nucleons contained because the nucleus is positively charged. So you can contain it in a magnetic field and you can keep this thing rotating and keep it hot, keep it alive and transfer energy out of it. That's the way to go. And, and that's pretty well recognized. That's the way to go. But they're getting good information out of NIF on some of the parameters of burning. Now they're burning DT gas, just like we do with this. There's a nice chapter, uh, do you know, for instance, Milky Vares, who works here, he's another scientist in residence. So he has a co-authored book with Rich Wolfson, who was from the, from the college called Nuclear Choices in the 21st Century. And there's a really nice chapter that just came out, I think a year or two ago um, on this specific topic, like what the prospects are like and on this stuff in general. So, and actually we have an unlimited license. I don't know if we could share it with you. Have, we could probably share it with you because you have an I have yeah, official. There we go, the I can send you the link. Okay. Yeah, license, but send it to me too. Okay. Yeah. So welcome to our question. director on the Zoom. And <laughs> okay. Anyone else who has a question on the Zoom, please raise the yellow hand function. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jessica. George, this was fascinating. Um, now I remember when I first I wrote my first book back in I think 1982 called Nuclear Power and Nonproliferation: an Interdisciplinary Perspective. And at that time, the kind of the big buzz in the field. Uh, of nuclear engineering, at least one of the big buzzes, was the potential for laser enrichment to transform uh, the enrichment uh, kind of process. And it seems like every 10 years, uh, that remains, you know, on the horizon. Maybe it's it's also like, uh, you know, uh, the uh, fusion technologies you were just talking about. Uh, and I'm kind of curious uh, what your assessment is today. I, I mean, are, are the main obstacles to adoption of uh, laser enrichment technologies of a technical nature, a regulatory nature, uh, the concerns about uh, you know concealment and, and greater difficulties from a proliferation standpoint, um, or the costs uh, of, of the technology. Could you say just a few words about that? Sure, what Phil is, what Phil is talking about is using lasers to Hit gas of uranium 235 and 238 and do the enrichment by twiddling with the energy levels. Okay. And they, they have different energy levels. So you can kind of set up things. Uh, Livermore had what was called the AVLIS, A V L I S program. It was very successful. And it was so successful that the Department of Energy shut it down <laughs> because it was too dangerous. And I think the reason that it it or other programs like that have not been created is that centrifugation works and it works relatively cheaply. And although Alice could be pushed to work from our side, we have no incentive to push it from other people who have centrifugation. They don't have either the wherewithal or want to try and do that, but it will work. It, uh, I think if they push the Avalet project through to conclusion, uh, it would have worked, uh, then it would have been, you know, if you go back a step when we were using, started out with gas or thermal diffusion, then we did gaseous diffusion, we had these huge plants back on the bridge doing gaseous diffusion, big signature, big energy footprint. Centrifugation, a lot less energy, a lot less footprint. Alice would be even lower footprint. And so, Potentially, you might have some state that wants to proliferate uh, by doing it, but it would be a very advanced laser technology. And they'd have to have a development program to develop it, which in itself might become detectable. But it was a real concern about the proliferation of enriched material via, via Alice. Now, there are three things you need to build a nuclear weapon. You need to have a design. And there are designs out there that will work. There are a lot of designs out there that won't work. You have to have technical skills to build the weapon. In other words, you have to have the machining capability, you have to have the plutonium handling capability, that sort of thing. Those are like machine shop level skills, which exist pretty much all over the world. And the third thing you have to have is you have to have material. And that's the only thing that we can protect and the only thing that we can base our non-proliferation programs on is protection of materials. 
George, I'm going to go ahead and use my moderator's privilege to ask you one more thing before sure. we close out the seminar, because I think this is a, a hugely interesting topic for, for most of us. Going back to Ukraine, a lot of the articles that have come out have been about how do we have political agreements to protect nuclear plants in these circumstances. Obviously, when countries can disregard human rights issues and all kinds of things they've signed up to in other areas, they could easily disregard them in the nuclear realm. Are there any technical measures that you would think are worth considering to try and protect plants as we build them in the future, at least, but possibly also retroactively in these kinds of situations? Well, you, you, you certainly could consider, uh, well, let's go back, yeah, design basis threat, you generate a new design basis, basis threat, you increase the, uh, uh, you know, Protective capability of containment, you, as Philip mentioned, there are other things you can increase the protective capability of those. But you can also do things like uh, put in passive anti-drone stuff, like put in netting. I mean, you're seeing the use of netting in uh, Ukraine now, primarily by <laughs> Russian forces, who figured out that you know, the, the drones can't get at them through the nets. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, you know, and, if you're someplace like Iran, you go to a nuclear site in Iran, it's got any aircraft missiles around it, things like that. And I don't, and I assume uh, in Israel that's the same around their uh, power plant, but I don't know. I don't remember, you know. But I, would, I would assume that they have protection against air attacks. Um, Actually, all Israeli tanks now have these little okay. primitive things just to, to shield it. Okay. And it was added very fast. And the Russians added them very fast to their tanks. Uh, you know, uh, those would be called the American Army of field alt, and field alts could be very popular, like welding extra extra shields on the side of your Humvee. Uh, so, yeah, I I suspect after Ukraine winds down that there will be the UN may call some treaty convention to try and come up with a specific treaty dealing with. Nuclear power plants, other nuclear facilities. Uh, the question is going to be how long is it going to take after the Ukrainian war is over before the Russian Federation becomes back as a useful member of non proliferation and unity and, and buys into these things? I, I have no personal way to predict that. Well, thank you so much, George, for this excellent seminar. We really appreciate it.